It is a yearly lecture that is given at the Faculty of Law, University of Bergen, by a distinguished international expert of criminal law and criminal justice. And this year's lecturer is Professor Dr. Ton Lifford from University of Leiden. And the title of his lecture is Child-Friendly Justice and Procedural Safeguards for Children in Criminal Proceedings, a New Impetus for Children in Conflict with the Law. This subject of children's rights in the criminal justice system is highly important. It is also a timely matter to discuss now, when the UN Child Convention soon celebrates its 30th birthday. It is a sad fact that also children commit crimes. At the same time, children are more vulnerable than adults and require specific care for their continuous development. The criminal justice system in many countries has in this light developed special procedures and measures for children offenders. But the situation is still challenging. And on the other hand, we are witnessing a harsher criminal policy towards precisely juvenile offenders. And I'm really grateful in this light that Professor Dr. Tom Lifford, with his great experience in this field, has accepted to provide a lecture on this important topic. Professor Li Lifford is Vice Dean for Education of Le Leiden Law School. He is full professor of children's rights, and he holds the UNICEF ch Chair in Children's Rights at Leiden University, Leiden Law School. He wrote his dissertation in 2008 about the deprivation of liberty of children in light of international human rights law and standards. And he has since then published and teaches widely on the topics of children's rights, juvenile justice and child-friendly procedures. He also has a large practical experience, he serves in, for instance, as a judge. So I'm very grateful that you could come. The lecture will last approximately 45 minutes, and then we will have time for questions and discussions directly after. We will finish at the latest 11.45, or earlier if we do not have any more to discuss, which I really hope that we have. So again, I'm really del delighted to welcome you, and Professor Lifford, the floor is yours. All right, good morning. Good to be here. First time in Bergen, and I brought Dutch weather. I'm sorry for that. I've just been informed that the past week I've been beautiful, and now it's raining. And it's very cold, to be honest, for me. But that's uh, just being me. Um, it's an absolute privilege to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's an honor. Um, being invited for the Bergen lecture, um, and, and um, is an honor. And being able to talk about the field that I find particularly important as part of this lecture series is a privilege. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you for um, reaching out to me. And, uh, and, um, and I would like to thank you all in advance for um, the dialogue we are undoubtedly going to have. This is a field that is emerging it's a field that leaves us with many, many questions, but I think it is altogether a very interesting development that has implications for children um, that are not necessarily seen, regarded as children in the first place. They are children, but they are the children in a system that is primarily targeted at the, um, yeah, the, 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 the safety of society. And in that particular context, children run the risk of being stigmatized, being regarded as problematic, being regarded as delinquent, um, without sufficiently recognizing that they are children. And, and, and th that's the dynamic 
in which this development, child-friendly justice, procedural safeguards, fair trial rights, um, have to, um, to, to, to operate. So um, I would like to talk about child-friendly justice um, as, as a concept and how that emerged. And it is, in, in essence, it's a concept that is bridging human rights, children's rights, with um, criminal justice procedure, um, um, in, including fair trial. Um, and that's also what I would like to do. I would like to bridge between human rights of children or children's rights and the position of children in the criminal justice system. So indeed, my, my talk will largely be about the procedural rights of children, and I think that is very important because there's a lot of attention for the substantive norms and approaches, interventions towards children in conflict with the law. But altogether, I think we have not sufficient attention also in research for the procedural safeguards or procedural rights of children in the context of criminal justice and, and beyond, I would say. And my submission is that um, investing in the procedural safeguards of children, making criminal justice systems more child-focused, more child-friendly, will ultimately contribute to better outcomes for everyone. Um, but in order to understand its true potential, I think we need to do much better. We need to have much more exchange, we need to have much more research, and we have to make um, that research also practically relevant. And that's why I'm also happy to see, um, uh, at least I've been informed, that you are from different backgrounds. So you are students, you're academics, you're, you're from practice, and that is, I think, a very important combination. So I would like to start with the children's rights perspective, and then I would like to go into the concepts, and then I would like to address the question, um, what about this new impetus? Is there indeed a new impetus, and what does it require from us academics and practitioners? So a little bit more about children's rights. Um, uh, it was already referred to, but children's rights um, have found its basis in international legal standards. Um, and the key document here is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, ratified by almost all countries in the world. Um, there's only one country that has not yet done so. Um, at this point, I'm not sure whether they will ever do. So it's, the, it's the, that, that particular country in the light blue. Um, but apart from that, all countries in the world have committed in one or the other way itself to, uh, to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, and children's rights are human rights. So they are about the fundamental values uh, related to treatment of human beings with humanity and with respect for human dignity. And that has been extended to different groups in particular, and children is such a group. So with the Convention on the Rights of the Child, it was confirmed legally and also in a legally binding way, uh, embraced also by many domestic jurisdictions, including this one here in Norway, that children are rights holders in the first place and that they are equally entitled to be treated with respect to humanity and human dignity in an equal manner um, uh, com uh, compared to adults. Uh, in addition, you could say that children have special entitlements. Children have special entitlements because they are a specific, special group of human beings with the key characteristic that they are developing. So children is not a homogeneous group. It's a group that, of human beings that develop from being the just-born baby into becoming the adolescent in transition into adulthood. And as, as, of course, now today we know that that even goes on after reaching the age of 18, which is generally the age of majority in, in domestic systems. So, so children have received a very solid legal, um, uh, strong legal status with, with the convention. 30 years later, um, we have to ask the question, where do we stand? What, what has children's rights, um, the Children's Rights Conv Convention delivered? And, um, and I think we should not get overexcited here. 
Um, children's rights, of course, are in many parts of the world still um, uh, rights in paper and not so much in, 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 in practical meaning. Um, some refer to this almost universal ratification, which um, should be seen as a great success. So, yes, I think it is interesting and it's important that we can talk about children's rights wherever we are, um, with governments, with others, um, but of course it doesn't tell that much. Um, children's rights are about principles, but ultimately they have to be about outcomes. They have to be about deliverables. They have to be about securing children's development. It's, it should be about children's well-being, long-term well-being, and also maybe even flourishing. So children's rights have to come with more, but they present an important set of principles. And I'm also convinced uh, in, 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 that that has meaning because what we see uh, happening here in Europe in particular is that children's rights have started to inform the broader human rights discussion with regard to children and parents, and also has resulted in more practical and tangible uh, approaches with regard to, uh, to, to children in specific contexts. So, for example, children in the criminal justice context. Um, and it is a, a, a framework that is evolving constantly. Um, the convention was drafted in the 1980s. That was a completely different period of time. Um, so this is 1989, everyone was happy, celebrating a convention on the rights of the child after 10 years of drafting, but it was a time frame that was different com compared to the time frame we have now. And it's likely that the future is different than today. So this is the Berlin Wall and it represents basically the end of the Cold War, uh, the then Cold War maybe, and children's rights were developed in that time frame. So you see reference, for example, to the nuclear family. You see no reference to the digital environment and there's no reference, for example, to issues that are relevant um, uh, as we speak, such as climate change. So the world today is different. And that is, I think, the time frame in which also children's rights have to play their role. Um, uh, um, uh, children are living offline and online. That has also implications for criminal justice. Uh, children are motivating themselves. They are politically active. Um, there are there's much more attention for also other actors than than the state as the as the safeguarder of children's rights. So we are also talking about business and we're talking about service providers. And I think we are have much more reason also to look beyond the nuclear family. So, so it's a different time frame, and that has implications for, for, for the juvenile justice system. So, juvenile justice and children's rights. The Convention on the Rights of the Child has clearly confirmed that juvenile justice had a system in place to respond to children offending, committing criminal offenses, um, is, an, is an issue of children's rights. Th this convention has two specific dedicated provisions for juvenile justice. Um, I don't know to what extent you, you are familiar with this, I'm not going to dwell on it, so I've tried to use all my graphical skills to make some kind of summary. Um, um, and uh, the bottom line is that if children are brought into the criminal justice system, which is not their decision, which is a state intervention, Children are entitled to be treated in a child-specific manner and in a fair manner. And these two pillars are basically the pillars on which the whole children's rights agenda is built as far as children in the justice system is concerned. So it's about child specificity and it's about fairness. And fairness is a broader term than fair trial. So you see that here it's about child specificity, which, for example, requires that you, you, you as a state, you invest in your, your workforce, in, in, in a workforce that is specialized, that, is, uh, that understands to, uh, you know, what it takes to deal with children as, as offenders. And it's about fairness. And, of course, the, the, the most important component of that is, is the right to be treated with respect to the right to a fair trial. Yeah? So in that... Uh, that is also the reason why the convention basically repeats many fair trial standards that can also be found, for example, in the European Convention of Human Rights. 
But there's a little bit more. We, we, the, 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 the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of a Child, is, is, has to be seen as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a critical component of a children's rights framework that deals with juvenile justice. And there we see that we have to talk about you know, which children fall within the scope of the criminal justice system. So we have to talk about age limits. And what you see roughly is that we are talking about 12, 14 as the minimum age and 18 as the upper age. So children within that time frame, generally at the time when they commit the offense, they are considered to be falling within the comp uh, competency of, of the criminal justice system for children, if there's any, and yeah? not all countries have that. Then there is a clear approach that, uh, uh, of, uh, there's a, cl a clear incentive on the basis of children's rights uh, and the children's rights framework to approach children in conflict with the law uh, in a pedagogical way. So to, to connect to their developmental level and to connect to their needs as human beings in development, which should ultimately be targeted at the child's reintegration. And the convention is quite explicit there. They say it's not only about reintegration, it's also about assuming that children have a constructive role to play in the society. So, in other words, if, yeah, we have to invest in children because otherwise we lose them as the potential for the future. Yeah? So, 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 reintegration is also uh, investing, in a way. This rules out a purely repressive approach. And that is always important to tell, particularly those who are uh, working for government and are under the, under the influence of political debate, for example. Uh, and um, uh, is, is that, 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 that children's rights and juvenile justice mean that we have to talk about the pedagogy behind our intervention and that rules out a purely repressive approach um, even though children can commit serious offenses. Eh, we should not shy away from that. Diversion is a very important component that is advocated for by the Children's Rights Convention, which basically means that you have to move children away from the too much formality. So try to be speedy and diligent in your intervention by offering out-of-court settlements without and preventing uh, from, uh, you know, the, the child and, and, uh, from going through the whole formal system. So diversion is a clear uh, a message coming out of children's rights. You have to invest in diversion. And then finally, um, if we talk about uh, sentencing, but also the use, for example, of pretrial uh, uh, coercive measures, then the clear message from children's rights is that you should try to, to, to stay away from deprivation of liberty. So try to reduce the use of pretrial detention, police custody, imprisonment as a form of disposition. Um, and, 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 and that is based on the, on, of course, also on the assumption and the fact that uh, children's uh, detention has a significant impact and largely also negative impact on children's uh, development. So these are, in, in a nutshell, basically the, the key messages coming out of, of juvenile justice, of uh, children's rights for juvenile justice, and it, it confirms basically that children are different. Children are different from adults, and that Re uh, requires us, uh, the state in particular, to deal with them differently. Um, maybe it's important to say that this is not something that um, uh, was invented by children's rights. Uh, um, many of the notions that you see in the Children's Rights Convention um, uh, were notions that developed at the national level. And sometimes people pretend as, as, as if the convention is something that is invented in New York and therefore not, oper not useful, for example, or difficult to use, uh, not fit for certain domestic jurisdictions. Um, it's also important to, 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 to remind them that, that this, this, these provisions and these assumptions were not there if they would not have been able to count on support domestically. And, that, and you see that in Europe in particular because many domestic jurisdictions already had some kind of awareness and sometimes even already a separate system for juveniles, but awareness around the fact that children are different. Um, so it's important to ask the question, what have we seen since the Convention on the Rights of a Child um, uh, entered into force in 1990? And having this strong approach, with a strong message, a set of messages coming out of, of the Convention with regard to juvenile justice. Well, I think you see different things. One is that children's rights have confirmed domestic practices. 
So it confirmed that it's important to treat children differently, separately, in a specific way, with, for example, a separate juvenile justice system. In my country, for example, the, the juvenile justice system dates from 1905. So you could say the Children's Rights Convention confirmed that it was good that we have something like that. Yeah, simple. But what you also see is that the Convention on the Rights of a Child stimulated law reform at the domestic level. So it stimulated new acts uh, specifically devoted to children in the justice system. You see an emerging body of case law around children's rights in juvenile justice. And you see a lot of um, awareness raising and advocacy and also policy reform around uh, juvenile justice practices. And I think to a certain degree, Academia has also been inspired by this whole approach, and that means that we see also much more uh, science around uh, 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 children's rights notions and juvenile justice. Um, where you could say you could say that when the Convention on the Rights of the Child was drafted, we were not having much scientific evidence that um, children required a specific approach. We were not having that much evidence that um, a, a specific approach for children in conflict with the law would have also uh, a positive uh, effect on, on, our, on, 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 the, on our interventions. So I think it's fair to say that today we have a much stronger scientific basis for, uh, for the claims we make on the basis of children's rights. Uh, than, than before, than during the drafting. And uh, when I say that, I refer specifically to everything we know about child development and the impact of child development uh, on issues, very important fundamental issues, such as culpability, um, uh, participation, and also uh, effectiveness of interventions, uh, the whole what works uh, uh, agenda. So I think the assumption that children are different is now much more supported by scientific evidence. And I think we also have, of course, reason to believe that children uh, are not alone in that regard. We also have to be concerned about young adults. So we have also now much more important insights that I think have to be brought into the discussions around juvenile justice at the domestic level, rela relating to uh, what works, uh, how to deal with young adults, and how to invest in due process. But of course, we also see persistent challenges. And I can only list a few, but there is persistent concerns about violence in institutions, in juvenile justice, but also broader than institutions. Um, we see that there is uh, still uh, a lot of concern about the root causes of juvenile delinquency and an inadequate uh, uh, approach with regard to prevention. Um, we see that not all children can equally benefit from from children's rights in the context of juvenile justice. Also in, in my own country, in the Netherlands, we have seen that there is reason to, to be concerned about uh, the, the way children from different ethni ethnicity and different ethnic backgrounds, migration backgrounds, are treated compared also to children with a non-migration background. And I think we are still in the process of starting to acknowledge that. So I think there is still an issue with persistent challenges that stand in the way of a full realization of children's rights in this particular context. Um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, which over, uh, overlooks the implementation of children's rights, also um, understands that. And they have now just recently, in September, published their new general comment on children's rights in the child justice system. It's replacing the old one, and a general comment is meant to give guidance also, also to states on how to live up to their, 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 their obligations on the children's rights. And they say, listen, it's important to, to always remind ourselves that we are not talking about a, you know, a purely wealth, welfare system, that we are only focused on children's needs. No, the justice system is, of course, um, having a legitimate aim in the pres uh, preservation of public safety. And within that context, children's rights play out. We have evidence that shows, and that is, this is a quite strong statement, I'm not so sure whether they have all that evidence, but they say we have evidence that show that if we invest in the rights of children, that we will ultimately also reduce the prevalence of crime committed by children, but they are also still very much concerned about the harmful impact of criminal justice interventions on children. And that's why 
apart from all the investment we have to make in all the children's rights. In particular, we also have to invest in the whole organization of child justice uh, and the system, including the professional. And there is reason to, be, to do that, and this is another very topical development, uh, the Global Study on Children Deprived of Liberty just published uh, at least the General Assembly report and brought to the UN, and that basically confirms that there is a lot of concern about children inside institutions across the globe. I'm not going to dwell on it for time. If you are interested, I can talk about it. Um, uh, we can do that then later. So, let's go to child-friendly justice, because child-friendly justice emerged basically out of this whole children's rights system, and it has brought us at a moment in which we seriously have to consider how to deal with child-friendly justice and our procedural um, uh, 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 and our criminal justice systems. Child-friendly justice is a concept that is meant to, uh, as I put it here, to enable children to engage with and or participate effectively in justice proceedings. You can also say that child-friendly justice is a concept that is about children accessing justice systems. And I'm, I'm, that's absolutely true, but I'm using this line because in the criminal justice system, it's, as I mentioned before, it's not the child it's himself or herself that is approaching the system. The child is brought into the system by the state on the basis of the assumption that he committed a criminal offense. And that is a completely different starting point. So the, the impetus, I would say, to invest in child-friendly justice is also related to the fact that it's not the child that has decided to to, to engage with justice proceedings, but it's the state that does so. So uh, that makes, I think, the whole uh, issue around child-friendly justice more prominent. But what I want to say here is that the child-friendly justice concept has been picked up basically by the Council of Europe, so the Human Rights Organization of Europe, 47 member states, uh, and based in Strasbourg. And this is the European Court, for those who've never seen the European Court. The first time that I walked in, in Strasbourg, I was overexcited to see the European Court in real life. Well, this is the European Court. Um, now it's a little bit more common, but you know you have these institutions and you hear about it all the time as you know, being a legal student, etc. And then all of a sudden you're right in front of the European Court. Well, the European Court it has indeed been instrumental in the development of this child-friendly justice concept. And that's what I want to talk about a bit further in detail. Um, the European Court uh, already, uh, basically this year, uh, 20 years ago, um, had to deal with the, 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 the case of, of Jamie Bulger. I'm sure you, you, you've heard about it, and otherwise, um, 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 uh, it's not e difficult to Google uh, all, the, all, the, all the details, but it was about two very young boys who brutally murdered a young toddler. And it was caught by CCTV cameras and ultimately the child was killed um, uh, brutally, as I mentioned. And, and, and that caused such a public outcry in the UK um, that, uh, that these boys uh, were... Uh, were, 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 were yeah, put in trial, of course, and everyone was you know, speaking about it. There was a lot of public exposure. Ultimately, um, to, to go very quickly through the case, um, the court was brought before the European Court, and the question was, have these two boys uh, been treated well in light of Article 6 of the Convention of Human, uh, Human Rights? Um, uh, have they received a fair trial? And one of the big issues there was that the court ruled that particularly also because of the context of all this public exposure, this rather intimidating impact on the two boys, it, has ultimately, it was ultimately very difficult for the two boys to participate effectively in the trial, and therefore their fair trial was, was uh, right to a fair trial was violated. And more specifically, the court said, if you bring children into a formal trial proceeding, you have to make sure that that particular trial is adjusted to their age and to their level of development, to their emotional and intellectual capacities. You have to bring that in. You can't assume that the way you normally operate is automatically child-sensitive enough. Um, in doing so, and the court used different language, of course, here, they brought the right to effective participation of children 
into the sphere of the right to a fair trial. In other words, the right to participate effectively, to understand what is going on, to be able to respond uh, as a participant in the proceedings has to be seen as an element of the right to fair trial. If you cannot effectively participate, you run the risk that the trial as such is considered to be unfair, which is a serious human right concern. So the European Court, in other words, made effective participation an essential element of Article 6, and it was informed directly by the Convention on the Rights of a Child. It explicitly referred to Article 40, which builds on the notion of Article 12, and that is the right to be heard of children. The Committee on the Rights of a Child picked it up, and in its general comment number 10, in which it explains what it takes to implement the Children's Rights Convention, specifically in the context of criminal justice, the the U UN committee basically picked up on that effective participation narrative and they started to elaborate on that in that general comment and also in the other general comment on the right to be heard in criminal justice proceedings and beyond. Sorry, I need to check my notes now. Um, so, um, what happened actually is that the European Court started to inform, basically, the, the, the Committee on the Rights of a Child. And in doing so, the Committee on the Rights of a Child brought effective participation directly into the sphere of, of children's rights. Um, with more meaning than Europe, of course, because the UN Committee on the Rights of a Child deals with all states in the world, apart from one. Um, the Committee on the Rights of the Child, and I should give that to you, elaborated quite extensively on the implications of this all and in a very practical way. So they basically stated, the committee, a fair trial requires that a child is able to effectively participate, and it needs to comprehend the charges, it needs to be understand the possible consequences of the penalties, uh, it should be able to direct the legal representative, to challenge witnesses, to provide an account of events, to make appropriate decisions about evidence, testimony, and the measures. In other words, the committee really approaches the child as a full-blown actor. The whole court process should be done in an atmosphere of understanding to allow the child to participate and to express his, uh, herself and himself freely. The environment cannot be intimidating or hostile, insensitive, inappropriate, bearing in mind the child's age. And we should also invest in adequate support for children, appropriately trained staff, design of the courtrooms, clothing of the judge and lawyers, and also the fact that um, the privacy of the, ch the, the child has the right to have his privacy protected is also important here because one of the important features considered by the Committee of the Rights of the Child for Effective Participation is that the trial is held behind closed doors in order to prevent this Im intimidating outside pressure. And of course there can be exceptions, but the baseline should be behind closed doors. So it's interesting to see that this, basically, the, the European Court jurisprudence generated a much more specific agenda around effective participation, which ultimately, of course, finds its basis in children's rights. And that has informed the Council of Europe, and they started to draft the guidelines. And the primary reason to do that was that there was a, an enormous amount of diversity within Europe, but there was also a lack of know-how. How are you going to implement this? How are you going to make this relevant on a practical, uh, in a practical way throughout the justice system? Um, the guidelines took a, a broader approach. They, 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 don't, they do not only focus on criminal justice, but they uh, make it very clear that criminal justice is part of it, and we should also talk about informal and formal justice systems. Key elements, and I'm not going to dwell on it, it's, it's, it's extremely boring, but what I want to flag is that there are key elements that come back. Information, accessibility of the proceedings, assistance, the right to be heard, you have to recognize that, but you also have to provide feedback so that you explain to the child what you have done with the input of children. Um, time is an, 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 an element of relevance. If it takes too long, it effective participation becomes more problematic. Uh, we have to talk about safety, we have to talk about language, and we have to talk about the role of family and parents. Um, 
Dus dit was meant as guidance, but what you see is happening now is that the convention of the, the guidelines, which as such is, is, is really providing guidance, so it's not legally binding, states can easily say I'm not going to do anything with it, even though its notions are grounded in more hard legally binding uh, 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 judgments. Um, the, the legal relevance of this set is increasing because the, the, the European Court is now referring to it in its case law. So you see that there is now an, an ongoing uh, child-friendly justice uh, discussion in and around court jurisprudence that uh, increases uh, the legal relevance of this whole set of guidelines. Um, and what you also see is that the guidelines have started to inform research and it is, has generated a lot of awareness, uh, uh, awareness raising campaigns uh, at domestic level supported with EU money. There is now further standard setting, including in the EU directive, I will talk about that in a minute, and there is more policy development around child-friendly justice. Child-friendly justice could also be seen as a small export product because there's other regions that are now experimenting with similar sets of guidelines. There is the International Association for Family and, court, uh, and, and Juvenile Court Judges and they've um, adopted a similar set of guidelines to make their judges, their members aware of the importance of it. So you see that there is something spreading here. And it has also resulted in judges, for example, experimenting with, uh, with child-friendly judgments. I don't know whether you've heard of, of it, but there are some, some judges in England, but also in my country, that have started to, 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 uh, to at least raise the question and also deal with it in a way. Um, 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 if the, system, uh, uh, the question is then, if the system has to be child-friendly, what about my judgment? What if, how do I explain to a child what my judgment is? Uh, which is not easy to do, I can say that from my own practical experience, but it's something that is interesting. And it started to have influence beyond the justice system, but I will leave that for what it is. So the EU picked this up as well. They started to, to, to support uh, NGOs to, do, to prepare training for professionals to do, to do about awareness raising. We've also been involved in that as an academic institution. Um, uh, but also in terms of standard setting, the EU started to draft a directive and a directive is legally binding for EU member states and that is a, a, a directive that is specifically on the procedural safeguards for children. And again, you see that there is reference to information, to assistance, to um, urgency, so time, and there is also um, a reference to children and parents being present in the proceedings. So there is, and this is, this is legally binding for EU member states, so EU member states have to work on this, and in fact they already had to do that and have to implement this directive before the 11th of June 2019, and the com Commission is now expected to follow up on that to see how states are doing and to what extent they have actually implemented this EU directive. So this is not vague and legally soft. No, this is very hard legally binding law. Um, finally, and then, I'm stop, uh, then I will stop about standard setting. Finally, the committee has renewed its mandate, around, of, uh, its general comment number 24, and they have also reiterated this element of effective participation. Um, and they do that now also on the basis of child-friendly justice. So they refer to child-friendly justice as an incentive to, uh, or as a concept to, uh, um, uh, uh, for effective participation. But it has done a little bit more, and that is something I wanted to give to you because it's really brand new. The committee um, advocates for an age of 14 years of age. And an age, the MACR, is the minimum age of primary responsibility. And for the first time, the committee explains better why they think 14 is important. I don't know to what extent you know about this, but the committee advocated for 12 as the international minimum standard. So under 12, no prosecution. And as of 12, you could consider that. But now they say, no, no, we have to go up. And that is related to the knowledge we have about child development and their culpability and what they need. But, for the first time, they say, it's also about the child's cap capacity to comprehend, to understand criminal proceedings. So there is now a link between the minimum age and the child's competency to participate and understand the proceedings. And that is something that is really new, and it has been directly informed by this whole child-friendly justice development. 
Um, they also say you have to consider this also in light of your diversion mechanisms. So even if you choose to divert, which is good in light of children's rights, then you have to make sure that children can effectively participate in it. And I think we can talk about it because diversion is important also for your system. It is also important to, to flag that the committee considers child-friendly justice relevant in the context of deprivation of liberty. So if children are detained, institutionalized, or whatever you call it, they have to have means to engage with the system and to access justice to address the way they are being treated. And that has many implications. But interesting in that regard is that the committee advocates for acknowledging that children, as from the moment they are arrested, are considered to be deprived of liberty. And that means that the whole child-friendly justice system should actually also extend to that first initial step resulting in arrest. And then finally, and that is also an important addition, the committee for the first time recognizes that we have to keep an eye on children with developmental delays, disorders, and disability. And we should not assume that they can automatically participate in the same way as others. And that is also an important addition to the narrative around child-friendly justice. It makes it sharper, it makes it more tangible, I think. All right. <laughs> Reflecting on this all, because this was about standard setting, I hope you see that there is now this legal, comprehensive set of standards that came from the UN into Europe, started to inform the UN again, and starts to, to branch out a bit. And of course, Europe has the benefit of having this human rights infrastructure and the EU infrastructure, and that is, that is not everywhere in the world. Eh? So it's difficult for, for, for parts of Asia to do something similar. But they also started to show interest in what is happening here. So I think, in a way, um, there, is, there is something to be expected happening there in the future, but not uh, to the same extent automatically. So the European Court, for example, has been very instrumental here. But I think there are three key messages coming out of this. And one is that it, is, it has to be about information to children. It has to be about support, legal support and otherwise. And it has to be about direct contact. So these three messages come out of this hall. And of course, there's much more detail, but I, I'm not going to dwell on that. Information, support, direct contact. And the direct contact could also be connected to the input children themselves gave to the drafting of the guidelines. And they say a lot that is happening with us in systems is ultimately about the lack of respect, or at least our experience of being treated disrespectfully. So children indicate themselves that they feel that they are not fully respected. And that is something that is coming back again and again and again, is that if you deal with children, regardless of what they have done or what they are accused of, of where they come from or whatever, they, they have this, I would say, rather genuine feeling that they want to be respected. And then they can even accept a harsh penalty. But if they are not feeling respected, it's, even, it's, it's more difficult to accept the outcome. So that means, for, in my view, that we have to reach out. We have to make sure that we connect to their, in a way, experience, their, their desire to be respected. And that is, I think, a role that a professional has to play. And of course, as you know, there are many different professionals. But in general, it's an, there has to be an outreaching role for professionals. And the professional have to be backed, has to be backed up there. In the context of criminal justice, it plays out in all stages of the proceedings. Um, it's not only about the trial. For example, I think we have to invest in much more knowledge about child-friendly justice, for example, in, in probation. We have to talk about out-of-course settlement because it plays out there, diversion. It is about the role of parents or an appropriate adult, which is something that also emerges more and more and more. If the parent is not the one, then who, who can provide for support and who is also trusted by children? Children themselves suggest that they see family, parents, family and friends as the, as the ones they trust, while there is a, generally a complete lack of this trust, trust in, in the system, in the professionals. So there's something to bridge there but with the help maybe of the support 
from an adult. Language is relevant. And I think the whole child-friendly justice concept is particularly relevant for children deprived of liberty in many different ways. That is all coming out of what I've tried to show you today. More conceptually, I think it makes us think about how to approach children. And you could say the more traditional approach to children is that they are vulnerable and that they, for that reason, they are entitled to special protection. I think with children's rights, it's about connecting protection with participation slash empowerment. And this whole movement is around acknowledging the dynamic between protection and participation. Of course, in the specific context of criminal justice, protection is extremely important. Children are very vulnerable in the criminal justice system. From the very first contact with the police, there is a lot at stake. And we know that it's difficult to comprehend everything. And we know that it is difficult to, to, to pick the right strategy. It's already for adults difficult, but it's for children even more difficult. So yes, there is reason to offer more protection. But it should not mean that we should not invest in participation at the same time. Child-friendly justice make, should make us think about how to approach children and their autonomy. The Committee on the Rights of a Child advocates or carries out the message that if you can be held accountable, so in other words, if you are older than the minimum age of criminal responsibility, so you're assumed accountable, that that also means that you're fully competent to participate. That is a bit of a tricky one, because is that really true? Can children be regarded as autonomous? I don't think so. I think there is still reason to say there is need for support, there is need for help. You cannot assume the same level of autonomy that we assume with adults. And I'm leaving the position of young adults now as it is. So we should think about it. How should we deal with that? And how should we then, in that particular context, deal with children's evolving capacities? We should also think about what the implications of this all are, are for other systems than the criminal justice system. And also in the particular reality that criminal justice systems are strongly connected to other systems. So, um, and I think that's true for this system as well here in Norway, is that children may not end up in the criminal justice system because of their offending, but they may de be dealt with in the welfare system or they may have experience already in the mental health system. And these systems communicate with each other. And that is also related to you know, investment in systems, etc. But this whole concept has to be brought further than criminal justice. We have to talk about child-friendly justice in the welfare system, in the child protection system, in the youth care system, in the mental health system. And I think this whole child-friendly justice development gives us reason to fundamentally reflect on the position of children in domestic justice proceedings in general. So having you here with us on civil procedural law, I think we have reason to reflect on our assumptions with regard to legal capacity or incapacity. Um, uh, and, and that's what we are doing now in the Netherlands as we speak. So. We assume, for example, in civil law proceedings that children are incompetent. Is that really still valid? Oh, something to talk about maybe later, if you have time, Mr. Weistein. And I don't think you have time. <laughs> but but it, would be, it would be great. All right, I, I have to stop. Uh, I, I'm already running out of time, I think. Is it okay? Okay, good. I, um, this is not a perfect world, eh? don't get me wrong here. I'm, I'm a bit excited. but. We are talking about gaps, unclarity, inconsistency, weaknesses. It's not all that strong. It's not all that wonderful. But what it, it is telling us something. It is telling that we have to move beyond traditional ways of approaching this. We have to move beyond talking about children in conflict with the law as being a problematic group. We have to invest in them. We have to make sure that we do everything we can to empower them to engage with us in the system. Is this a European consensus approach? No, not at all. What we see is that one of the reasons for the standard setting is the reality that there is a lot of diversity in Europe and also a lack of willingness to empower children in the system. 
So there is reason to be critical here. There is not such a thing as European consensus of this. Um, the two 2014 studies that have been commissioned by European Commission in administrative law, in civil law, and in criminal justice show an enormous diversity in, 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 in specialized services, the, the availability of youth courts, um, um, uh, possibilities for children to, to participate, um, recognition of rights, time limits. I mean, it's, it's really diverse, and that makes it also complex and dependent on cases such as the one I discussed before the European Court in order to you know, get a, some kind of understanding of some kind of European consensus here. And of course, this is not easy. Being a professional in the justice system, hearing a lot about child-friendly justice, the question ultimately is, how am I going to do that in my daily work? And that is absolutely important. That ad question is absolutely important. We have to find answers for that. Because this is a very complex system with many different interests and many different um, stakeholders. So the police, for example, is not only concerned with the rights of the child. The police is about law enforcement. The police is about gathering evidence. The police is about making sure that everyone is okay, including the child. So if you want to make this operational, you have to go into that reality. And you have to make sure that child-friendly justice in that particular reality of the police official can be can make any sense, let's put it that way. And that's where academia comes in as well. This raise, there are fundamental questions to be raised, as I mentioned to you, autonomy, protection, participation, how do we actually reconcile that all? Quite fundamental. But ultimately, we have to also support practice with applied research. In 2014, there was a large research project published by the European Commission and I think we have to follow up on that. We have to understand how our systems opera operate, how we can improve systems, and how, what systems can learn from each other. So I think maybe Bergen and Leiden can do something in comprehensive European comparative studies. We have to zoom in on specific groups of children that may have more difficulties with engaging. We have to zoom in on specific stages and not forget disposition and paro parole and probation. We have to talk about the other systems, and I think ultimately we have to talk about 18 plus as well. Um, but the key message is that we have to invest. We have to invest in being inclusive. We have to invest in making children aware of the fact that they matter, that they are an active participant in the system that comes at them because they are assumed or alleged of committing an offense within the reality that children do commit serious offenses, within the reality that we cannot shy away from that, and the criminal justice system is in place to respond to that. <coughs> but we have to do it in a way that we leave no one behind. And that's basically my key message. I started with that, that we invest in this, that we can maybe also more get more uh, better outcomes. Uh, but in order to really understand that potential, we have to join forces, academia, practice, um, and that's why I would like to reiterate that the, my, my gratitude for the invitation because this helps me to talk about it and hopefully you talk with me um, about it and then we can uh, move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this very enlightening lecture. And uh, now it's time for questions and discussions. So please go ahead. So I have. We can use this one. So. Can also, this one is easy to use because okay. just throw them around. Thank you, uh, Katra Luhamo, uh, being in the Center for Research on Discretion and Paternalism in Admorg. Yeah. Um, I think we met. Yes, we yes. did meet in Tartu. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and thank you for the wonderful presentation. I think that the topic you discuss is very important. But um, I have been actually wondering that there is a big group of children whose rights in the criminal procedure we do not touch up at all. And um, I checked also the CRC uh, general comment, and while the draft comment was focusing on children in juvenile justice, the uh, current uh, general comment is focusing on children in justice system. And we are actually forgetting about victims, 
child, mm. children mm. as victims mm. and children as witnesses mm. in criminal proceedings. Yeah. And I would argue that probably most children participate in criminal proceedings as victims or as witnesses. So do you see that this kind of, uh, do, do you acknowledge the same kind of problem and, and, and can the principles developed here for general justice system somehow help us in overcoming the yeah. problems for children who are victims of, yeah. of, uh, of different types of crimes or, or we are, who are included as witnesses? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, very good point. And shall I respond straight away? Yeah. Um, um, yes, uh, this is a valid point. Um, one thing, uh, I, I didn't really understand the point with regard to the general comment because they, they are, they, it is still about juvenile justice, even though they call it child justice now. I know, yeah, and I know where it comes from. It comes from South Africa, where they, they say the juvenile, that, that is a stigmatizing term. So we want to get away from it. We have to acknowledge that this is about children. Legally, that's also true. Yeah? All children under, uh, persons under 18 are defined as children under the Children's Rights Convention, so that's why we choose children. But you run into trouble because children, of course, and adolescents, yeah, that is not necessarily regarded as the same. Um, uh, but I, I still think it is about juvenile justice, though, even though they call it differently. But the point is very, very important. Um, yes, and I, I didn't talk about children as victims today. And I could have included them because in 2005, uh, the UN adopted uh, the guidelines on the protection of children as witnesses and victims. And it is referring to the importance of child-sensitive systems, systems that are in place to recognize that children are, are, have this particular vulnerability, which means that we have to reflect on the way we deal with them in the criminal justice context. And that is a very important topic. And in a way that has also influenced our thinking about around child-friendly justice. Um, it, it has become a bit messy because we are now using all kinds of different terms. Um, but the child sensitivity element is, is crucial for, I would say, all children that engage in one or the other way with the formal justice system. Um, being a, It can be a criminal justice system, it can be a civil justice system. So, so I think this is an absolute valid point. Uh, and, 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 and it's quite interesting to see that in, 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 in countries that there is quite a lot of attention for the child as the victim or witness and or witness. So, for example, many investments have been made with regard to special child uh, hearing studios, for example, with colors and, and drawing material, etc. And there is, I think, much more awareness that, that, that trying someone in a criminal court um, with having a child as a victim slash witness does not always mean anymore, luckily, that we have to bring in the child to give a testimony right in front of everyone. So, so, so that awareness, I think, is increasing and increasing and increasing, and also recognized legally uh, by the European Court, stating that it's not necessary to do that eh, anymore. Eh, you can rely on a statement given outside in a special uh, interrogation room dedicated to children uh, without uh, bringing the child into the court. But that sensitivity had, had to grow, and it's still growing. Um, my take on it is that there is more sensitivity there than in the, in the, with regard to child offenders. And, and that, is, that is also part of the problem, because I think we see children as victims, as victims. So we need to help them. While children as offenders, they are not considered as such. They are considered as, as a problem, as, a, as an offender, as a delinquent. And, 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 uh, yeah, and that requires uh, an extra step. But thanks for the comment, because it's, uh, it's making the, the story more comprehensive. Yes, then we had one question from Jan. Okay. Um, <coughs> thank you for a, a wonderful lecture. It was uh, really uh, thought-provoking, and uh, I enjoyed listening to you very much. Um, now, I'm far beyond my field of expertise, so now I can speak freely and heretically and everything. So, um, you spoke about children as offenders, and we heard a bit about the children as victims now. Uh, but what about children as judges? Um, you talk about inclusive uh, criminal justice here and also... Uh, and from my experience with, for instance, the sexual offences, which I work upon in substantial criminal law, uh, and reports and, and uh, documentation, it seems like children in many regards have a 
their own culture, their own language about this mm-hmm. phenomenon, mm-hmm. in a sense. And if we were really to sort of listen to the children's point of view, you should have children as judges who could sort of represent them, and, uh, because it's difficult for children as accused to sort of communicate this yeah. to professionals, to yeah. judges, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, so here's the provocative thought. Would it sort of provide even more inclusion if you have sort of children that was sitting there similar to the sort of uh, jury yeah. where we sort of emphasized the importance of being judged by one's equals and the importance yeah. of this. Yeah. Uh, so what about judge, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. judges? Yeah. Yeah. Normally if I get difficult questions, I pass them on, you know. <laughs> so what do you think? No, no. <laughs> That's the, uh, the... No, no, no. This is an interesting... This is a very... I'm hesitant here. Um, yes, I think there is a problem with connecting. So the adult narrative in criminal justice and the uh, the narratives that children use themselves. And, um, and, and there's this lack of trust, so there's a big issue, there's a big gap. So in a way, you, this is all about repairing something. In a way, this is about a disconnect between a child and a criminal justice system. And why do we need to invest in, criminal, in child-friendly justice? Because we need to make a system that is designed for, for adults more accessible for children. Yeah, <laughs> Isn't that, is that really something we should do? It's one of the reasons why we should become more innovative and we should keep them out of the formality. But it's not always possible. You know, what do you do with a child that is involved in gang activity? Um, uh, uh, what about a child that has raped someone? What about, I mean, it happens. So you could, okay. okay. But there's maybe in general, apart from the, from the specifics, um, is then the question, is it, then, is it good to, to let children judge each other? And there I'm a bit reluctant, because we, we have something, I don't know whether you have it here, it would be interesting to know, uh, but we have it in the Netherlands. There is a new initiative called the Youth Courts, and they, uh, Juvenile Courts, no, it's not Juvenile Courts, it's Youth Courts, Jongerenrechtbanken, Youth Courts, and they are run in schools. And then they, they basically play the, the court, and then they deal with a, a matter about uh, an offense in school. And, and I'm, 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 I'm hesitant there, because I think you bring, you play, first you play something. Is that really something you should do? Uh, so you play something that is, that is, that is, that is in the formal uh, setting available, and you do something. So maybe you have to do that differently. But there's one other main reason why I'm hesitant, and that is that I'm not sure where the child friendly justice means. I'm actually quite sure that it doesn't mean that that children have to make the decisions. It's not about making them responsible for the decisions. It is actually seriously problematic, I think, to do that. It's about a professional judge or a professional probation officer or a, uh, 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 another professional who takes probably a very difficult decision. Um, and if you include children in that sense, then they may feel that they are responsible for the decision. And that can be seriously problematic. It's one of the reasons why people are also reluctant. They say, I can't make the child responsible for the decision. I say, no, this is not about that. This is about making children a part of your decision making by including him or her. It's not about moving away from you as the decision maker. So I'm, but there is a, there is a connection issue here. So, so, so yeah. It looks like you want to. Just a, just a quick follow up. I fully agree with you on this sort of, uh, to sort of this uh, school alternative with the play and so forth. That seems yeah. problematic. Yeah. But it's perhaps not that a far-fetched thought that for instance, in a profession with professional judges that they in fact, in fact included, for instance, a 16 year old yeah. as a dialogue partner, if you had a yeah, it's interesting. trial. You could have sort of minor variants that within the court, in yes, the bench, precisely. or something. So, so as sort of a sort of um, uh, well, similar to the lay judges, yeah. as they work in Norway yeah. today. Yeah, and the whole issue uh, with regard to restorative justice, mm-hmm. eh, uh, setting up a, a conference, a, com- uh, uh, a dialogue, is 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 not a bad idea at all. The question is: is there is there still a need for for a, for a decision, um, uh, and who is taking that? Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. I, I have a question myself and a comment. And actually, I would like to challenge the concept of child-friendly criminal justice as, as such. Yeah, please. And because, uh, in a way, uh, we have witnessed over the last decades that the criminal law and the human rights, the child rights perspective, is to a certain extent uh, melting together. 
and the criminal law to an increasing uh, degree implements in different ways, which is of course good. The idea of the best for the child and the child rights. On the other hand, this could also function to legitimize intrusions uh, against children within the criminal justice system. And you see in Norway that uh, since we have got better juvenile prisons, we also have had some arguments in judgments that this could be actually be for the best for the child yeah. to be sentenced to prison because yeah. there is such a good interdisciplinary teams and things and uh, the child care institutions are maybe not that good, yeah. it could be argued. Yeah. So you see that this child perspective is actually de- legitimizing yeah. criminal justice. And uh, t- so to some extent, you could argue that the child perspective should be limiting criminal justing, justice intrusion, in, in, in interventions, but maybe it should not be used so ac- activ- actively as a sort of posi- positive concept that could also reconstruct the criminal law. Because you also see that if you should be critical towards the UN Convention and how it has been interpreted, and for instance of the UN Committee, I mean it opens more and more for the fact that the criminal justice interventions could be precisely for the best of the child. Yeah. And could they ever be? Yeah. In a way, I would say that criminal justice interventions, is, they are never friendly. And they are not meant to be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what do you think about this? Ja, ja. ja, dit is fantastisch. Uh, great. This, this is a good point. This is, this is, this is, uh, this is an issue. Um, one of the reasons, I think, why we should say um, um, juvenile justice is criminal justice in the first place. So uh, the, it has to be... The, the intervention on behalf of the state has to be justified on the basis of our, our, our criminal law. And I would say that the prime the justifications such as there is a crime committed, public safety, uh, the, the objectives of criminal justice interventions have to be taken extremely seriously. We cannot use the criminal justice system to do something good for a child in need. That is not the justification for the intervention. It's part of your... Uh, you, the. It has to be part of your intervention and justification for that, but the, the justification for intervening on behalf of the state in the criminal justice context has to be grounded in the justifications for, for such a thing in, in law. Uh, that's why I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very reluctant in assuming that this system has to become a system that is good for children. Um, but the reality is that children are dealt with uh, in the criminal justice system, and then I think we have to live up to our obligations, and that means that we have to make them, we have to take them seriously. Uh, but uh, yes, if you get overexcited about it, then you create the ideal system, and you want to channel everyone through that, and that is indeed also what you see. Sometimes the criminal justice system is is better organized, has direct access to services, while in other systems there are waiting lists, and children have to wait. So what do you do? You channel through criminal justice. We have seen that in the Netherlands as well, and, and the government denies it, but it happens because there's direct access. So there is an issue there. So I think it's an absolute valid comment, but that's why I think we have to make very sure that we are not uh, disregarding the justifications for the criminal justice intervention on behalf of the state. No, thank you. Thank you. I, I agree with you, but I think it's a, yeah. a difficult tension. It is, it is, and it, it, it plays also a particular role around ages also. Eh? So yep. the minimum age, for example. Um, but that's why I want to make the point today that if you invest in child-friendly justice, you have to do it comprehensively. But it's, it's actually the step after the question, which channel yeah. you choose, or you're allowed to choose, basically, yeah. as a state. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, thank uh, you. More questions or comments? Hi, uh, my name is Camilla. I work at the Ombudsman for Children's Office. Ah, nice. Yeah. Um, I'm very pleased to hear your lecture. It was great. Um, I wonder about child participation. There is a discussion in Norway regarding uh, criminal law and also 
within the welfare system, child welfare system, yeah. about uh, children's party rights. Uh, do you know party rights? Yeah, which rights? Party rights. Uh, I don't know what you call them. In the, when the child has certain rights within the uh, proceedings, yeah. for example, the, inform uh, the right to receive information, yeah. the right to yeah. present themselves. Yeah. I don't know what you call it in English. Nobody knows. Yeah, procedural rights. Aren't you lawyers, all of you? Yeah, yeah, but I don't know. I, I don't think know. <laughs> procedural rights? Or, or yeah, like the rights, party rights, maybe, rights yeah. as a party in, in Oh, as a conflict. party. Oh, as, as, as an interested party. party. Yeah. Yes, okay, yes. Yeah. yeah. So this yeah. is a discussion that we have in Norway. Yeah. At what, yeah. what age should a child yeah. have party <laughs> rights? Yeah. Uh, now a, a very current discussion in, uh, concerning the criminal law. And the, yeah. yeah. Could you answer the that? Civil please? law, you mean? Uh, well, it's, that's that is child welfare law, but this yeah. is now in in connection with the uh, criminal pro, uh, criminal process. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question is, at what age can a child be regarded competent to, uh, to have part, uh, party rights or uh, rights as, a, as, a, as, a, as an interested party? Yeah, yeah that is, no, nah, there's no such a thing as one age. I, I, cannot, I cannot say on the basis of children's rights it has to be 12. In my country, it's 12. It's 12. As of 12, you have the right to formally, uh, the formal right to be heard by the court, for example, in a uh, divorce case or in a child protection case. And it plays out throughout the system. It also organizes practice because the, the court basically checks, oh, this is a 10-year-old, okay, there's no need to invite him because he's not 12 anymore. But as of 12, you can. You can informally approach the court. And I think 12 is, uh, the justification for 12 is not given. Um, you see different ages here all the time. So there is uh, now the District Court of Amsterdam that is experimenting with eight. They say even though the law says 12, we do eight. And we invite all children between eight and 12, in addition to all the other children of 12 and older. And they send out a letter. And in the beginning, it was a very formal letter. I, I could not even write it or read it. So what, did, what do they mean? Do I need to come? Or am I obliged to come or whatever? Uh, there's, oh, there's the address. That's fine. You know, so, something. so they try to refra reframe that and make it more child-friendly. Uh, but it's still a court letter, which is difficult. Um, and, uh, but they started to do that because they think that they uh, excluded uh, children um, because of that age limit. Now... <laughs> Uh, I think they looked into it now and they, 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 they found something like 25% uh, of children uh, responded to the invitation, they came. And there were also children that explicitly said, no, 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 it's fine, I, I don't need to come. And there were also children that did not respond. So then the question is, who received the letter? Did they receive the letter, etc.? cetera? Um, um, on the basis of that experiment and also, also knowledge about child development, I think you could advocate for a lower, lower age. That is not my expertise, but I've been a member of a government committee advising the government on this, and we said, you have to look into this more specifically. 12, we are not sure, it's too high. You exclude children. And particularly in the context of family law, as of age of 8, 9, 10, they know very well what is happening. It's not that they are easy in making a decision. They don't make them make an decision. They, are, they have loyalty everywhere to both parents, etc. So, but you exclude them. And is that justified? We don't think so. You have to look into it. So that's the government doing now. But interesting, in the international child abduction cases, in uh, the district court, which is the, the, the court for these cases, uh, they use six. So as of six, there will be a guardian ad litem appointed for a child. And they set up an interview with the child, an informal child interview with the judge. They are struggling because they are doing uh, quite well, I think, but they are struggling in the sense that they are uncertain about how formal that should be and should the judge wear a gown, yes or not, you know, all these questions. And there's no, there's no, not, these, these questions are not always answered by this international framework. Eh? So you have to, you have to, um, you have to come with more. Uh, but I think it shows that the assumption that children cannot be hurt and therefore should not be hurt is, is something we have to, to, uh, to, to reconsider. Uh, and there is, uh, you, you know that maybe also, the, 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 the private international jurisprudence uh, 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 about recognizing foreign judgments is also about hearing children. So the, the German courts, I think, they have ruled 
um, that they did not rec dec recognize judgment from a foreign court because the child as of the age of four was not included in the proceedings. Yeah? It doesn't always mean that there has to be court involvement. Yeah? You can also hear through other channels and that is also, also possible. But the committee advocates for direct involvement as much as possible, particularly if the child suggests that he would like to be heard. Yeah, so, so this is not a an, an, an very um, helpful answer, maybe. But, but this is a good discussion. yeah, this is the discussion I think you have to have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Someone else feel obliged? Yes. Uh, I would like to make a brief comment on that. Um, my name is Lisa Soreda, and I'm working as a district court. And I think in regarding to to uh, as a child should be a party or not, you should turn the perspective and look at. The, the need of the child, for instance, in family case, uh, yeah. cases and in child care protection, maybe the, the child needs protection from their parents or whatever, and Possibly. then you can make yeah. them have a lawyer yeah. and in that way yeah. be sure that they have their rights yeah. fulfilled. Yeah. And, but if you should make the child as a party too young, you can make more procedures than yeah. necessary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, so that, that is a valid point. As a judge, I, yeah. I, sometimes in family cases, I'm, I give the child a, a lawyer just yeah. to protect the child. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. And what is then the assignment for the lawyer? What is, what is the assignment? What, 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 is the, what do you want him or her to do? In the ideal world, I want a lawyer to talk some sense into the parents. Ah, yeah. okay, okay, okay. That's but, very honest. But yeah. maybe to 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 give the to to really to get the ch children perspective in the case. Yeah. To to really yeah, to sure. help yeah. the child to yeah. to uh, yeah to the best for the child. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So it's it's. Yeah. Uh, I know it's it's could be in an in a, in an ideal world, but sometimes it can open the eyes and it can really bring the child sure. into the court sure. in a different manner. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I mean, the, the, the reality in family law cases, disputes, of course, is that children, they may easily get stuck in between parents. And parents, you know, they, they mess up dramatically. And, and children are somewhere, somehow. Um, um, and then, in the, indeed, someone appointed by the court to look at the specific interest of children is, is a very important uh, feature to break through that dynamic, and even though you cannot maybe not re-educate children of uh, parents, even, even though you want to, um, at least you get the child out of it. And so you, 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 you give the child a separate uh, avenue. Uh, the, the big challenge, I think, also is, that, uh, is the assignment for that. Uh, what, is the, what is the role of that appropriate adult lawyer guardian ad litem? Um, and, and, and if you say, yeah, the best interest of the child, that is, that is rather vague. Okay. Yeah, so can it also be a, a, a child-led exercise? So that the, child, that, that the lawyer is really engaging with the child, what do you want me to say to the judge? Or is it more about the lawyer making an assessment independently about what is needed to the judge? And I don't think we have much of consensus there yet. I think there's a lot of variety here. Uh, but I think uh, the whole thing around child-friendly justice, uh, I think, is an incentive also to instruct the lawyer that he or she should also open up to the to the to the true wishes of the child and to to make to to make them clear to the court. So uh, this is a lot of words to say. We have to make sure that th th there is the good assignment. <laughs> um, but it's interesting. Thank you for that. Yeah. It's, um, w I don't know, I, I, I spoke briefly about the child-friendly justice, uh, the, the child-friendly judgments. It, that is quite an interesting development. Uh, having a judge in the room, maybe I can, <laughs> I can uh, plan an ID uh, there. But there's this judge in England that uh, had to decide on this family law dispute, Mr. Peter Jackson. And uh, it was about uh, a mother living in the UK, and the father moving to, I think, to Sweden. And the child suggested to the court, uh, to the judge, I want to join my father. And then uh, the, nah, the, the, the court had to decide. And uh, as you know, that is not an easy thing to do. You have to decide. Um, so you're there for the decision. Um, and, and, and the judge wrote a letter to the child. And it's called uh, Dear Sam. And it was attached to the judgment. And he explains to the child what his decision is, was. And it, what is interesting about this example is that the, the judge explains a very clear wording that he didn't follow the wishes of the child. 
He said, listen, I'm not going to say that you're joining your father. I'm not sure whether you really want it. Such an interesting judgment. And then with this accompanying letter, showing on the one hand, I respect you and I want to s explain to you in nah, what, what, I refer, what I would say is child-friendly wording. I, I do my best to connect to you and explain in normal wording what I mean. And then he's also not following what the child suggests. And that makes the example even more powerful because it confirms that including children in proceedings doesn't mean that you have to do what they tell you to do. And you're taking the decision, and it may be something different than the child wants. But if you engage with the child in a serious way, then maybe it's more acceptable for the child as well. So that's an interesting example. And it's, it's a very small development, and, and judges in my country are doing it as well, and, and they, hopefully, they are struggling. I know that, I see that, and I, I can't do it myself. It's difficult, but it's, uh, it's, it's happening. It's quite interesting to see that. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We have time for some more questions, if there is someone. Yes. Thank you. Let me, let me have a short comment, not a question, but just sure. a comment. Sure. Because it's interesting, this uh, perspective in criminal justice, when you got questions from outside or uh, regarding uh, 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 children as, as victims and as witnesses, mm -hmm. and then we have this family law yeah. uh, uh, situations. Yeah. But what's, what I think is that uh, these children are rather often participating in different roles yeah. through their um, life as growing up children. So in one case, the child is a victim. In the next case, the same child can be the offender and so on. And yeah. from earlier, uh, in earlier years, perhaps there has been a family conflict. So yeah. all this is about how to include them in, yeah. uh, in, the, in the society, in the, yeah, yeah. at the, the right uh, side of the law and, and to, to, to grow up as, as uh, responsible um, particip yeah. participants in yeah. the society. Yeah. And so it's important to, to, to uh, see the, the broader picture. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you make the comment. I think this is, this is about uh, including children much more fundamentally and broadly, as you suggest. Also, uh, as you suggest. Um, I think, and that's why I make the point very quickly, that this is actually also maybe informing us for, for context outside of the, the justice system in the broad sense. Uh, the justice system is a system in place for family law matters, for civil law matters, for child protection, for criminal justice, for immigration. But it is also about children as, as citizens. It's about children as uh, being um, uh, affected by decision making in many different ways as a group, individually, in medical decision, in school, uh, in the community. So I think, the and that is what, what I f find particularly interesting about this whole children's rights uh, agenda, is that it is reflecting, I think, uh, and forcing us to reflect on the way we include children in society. Um, doesn't give all the answers, but it is a reason to reflect um, on these fundamental uh, approaches towards children. Uh, and it's ulti ultimately about merging uh, uh, the recognition of their vulnerability and immaturity and their evolving capacities, resulting ultimately at a certain point in autonomy. Um, I, I, in my teaching for my students in Leiden, I always use a medical decision-making as an example because it shows so, so clearly the, the problems. We, we run into trouble immediately. Um, so, but it's very fundamental. Um, it's about who owns rights. It's about who can exercise rights. Who can exercise on behalf of children. When do we grant autonomy? When? So it's it's very fundamental. Um, so that would be my comment to your comment. But I'm I'm, I'm glad you make it. Um, and and we there is also a lot of inconsistency there. So on the one hand we say you are you can also already be responsible and accountable as of 14, 12. 
uh, that is a criminal age, and then there's the civil age, and then, uh, yeah, voting, yeah, that's not something for children, so that's 18, and, uh, yeah, no alcohol, 21, and no drugs, uh, in the Netherlands, of course. <laughs> uh, I'm, always, I'm always using the wrong example here. Uh, also, for my international students, they all are like, this, whoa, this is the Netherlands, we are in the Netherlands here. So, no drugs at all, of course, for no one. Um, and these kind of um, yeah these these kind of questions make make I think this field so fascinating uh, and relevant. It's not only about academics and uh, having a fascinating work uh, environment, but it's also about reality. Yeah, yeah. That's I think why we need to include children in their input, and that's what I liked about um, about the about the drafting of the guidelines. So there were set, uh, questionnaires sent out to children. There were focus group meetings organized. Uh, by colleagues from uh, Kil uh, Cork and Belfast, uh, Laura Lundy and Ursula Kilkelly, uh, and they, uh, they 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 brought in uh, their own ex the experience of the children. I think that's that's absolutely vital here. Yeah. Yeah. A question about uh, child's right in the procedure, because at the moment we have some cases running for Strasbourg where the um, um, social authority have taken away the children yeah. from, yeah. from yeah. the parents. Yeah. Uh, do you have any comment that uh, when they making this complaint to Strasbourg, they let they accept in Strasbourg that the mother represents their child? Yeah. And there might be a huge conflict between the child's sure. interest and the sure. mother's. Sure. Do you have any com comment to that issue? Because it's established in the case law that a mother can represent her child, but do you have any comment on that? I, I think, find it very problematic. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you, um, and I think there is there is the court is sending out double messages here because uh, a child is capable of approaching the court independently from parents, but they approach many of these issues ultimately through the lens of the parents, and, and that is that is that is blurring the whole picture. Luckily, dissents uh, and dissenting opinions they they they, they, they try to, to to in a way repair that. But but there is there is uh, there is an there, there is an issue there with 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 how the court approaches it, uh, this. Um, and um, I think I know the cases where you refer to, and I think I, particularly in these cases it, it is problematic, also substantively, uh, because there is this conflict of interest. There is this or potential conflict of interest. So you cannot assume that that is proper representation. Uh, but it's still, I think, built on the notion, on the assumption that, that children are represented uh, in a way. And, 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 that is, and that is, I think, something that we have to, uh, to, uh, to criticize. Um, um, yeah, uh, that would be my answer now. Um, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I, I share the concern. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I think we have one last question here. Yeah. So uh, take that also. Um, well, I should like to ask you, I mean, the criminal system is not about guilt and innocence. The criminal system is about what can you prove? What can yeah. be... Yeah. I mean, it's not about whether you are, you are necessarily uh, yeah. guilt, uh, innocent, but what can be proven. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, this approach, is that necessarily good for a young offender, for a child? I mean, when my own child, who was then <laughs> younger than 15, was involved in some criminality, I, I sat down with him and his mates and said, now let's come clean on this. Tell me exactly what happened, and then we'll try to approach a victim, we'll try to find out what we can yeah. do about this. Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the way most parents would approach uh, criminality in a child, saying, Let, let's come clean about this so you can go on yeah. with a clean conscience, yeah. rather than saying, like some lawyers would say, now don't get into this because they cannot prove that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Is, yeah. is that necessarily yeah. a good approach for a child? No. No, I would say no. But what you do as a parent is you take your child extremely seriously. Because you sit down with him and say, listen, we have to talk about this, acknowledging also, you know, that you played a role or whatever. You, you were not there, most likely. But you want to, you, 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 you're, con you're having a conversation with your child in a safe environment. Uh, that is unfortunately not true for all parents. They cannot do that all. 
um, unfortunately, and, and of course, those children um, in court, then there's often a very unsafe environment. I'm, I'm always struck by the number of kids in front of the court that are from broken families, have been in and out of the care system all the time. And you, as a, as a criminal judge, you basically sit there and say, okay, what can we do? What can we do other than uh, let's look at the facts? Yeah? And this, where do you start? So, so I, 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 I think you make a, ver a valid point here. Um, uh, and what, what you do, in a way, is offering a, 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 a solution to deal with the fact and while addressing, I think, responsibility and taking your child and the other involved seriously. And, and I think the criminal justice system is, is having difficulties with, with that uh, um, because of its inflexibility, because of its formalities. And uh, you're also pointing at a very uh, problematic uh, uh, link, and that is, uh, um, is, is not, uh, uh, a, a problematic issue, and that is um, what is the role of the lawyer of the child? Huh? Is he going for including his client into a conversation, or is he saying, oh, don't say anything because they don't have enough evidence? Yeah, that happens. I know that, and I see that right in front of me. So it's very difficult to have a, some kind of pedagogical dialogue if the child sits there and says, "Well, I'm not saying anything because uh, my lawyer tells me to," uh, <laughs> something like that. And, uh, and and then we try and we try and we try. I mean, you can't try too much because then you run into trouble as a judge. Yeah. So uh, so I see that as an issue, and that means, and I don't have a wonderful solution for that. But what I s at the same time, of course, you have to write to defend yourself, and you have to write to, to, to contest and to, to keep your mouth shut. There's no obligation to participate. And, and, and within that reality, we have to make sure that children are taken seriously in a way. But it makes life, it, life is extremely difficult if this is the approach. So then, yeah, you would like to see lawyers um, that understand the sensitivity of this all and also understand that in a specific case it might be better for the client to talk. It's, it is maybe an incentive to say let's take away facts from solution. So that you say the facts, okay, you keep your mouth shut, it's fine, um, I, I see enough evidence, so you're guilty. And then, okay, now let's talk about how are you doing? And then sometimes the conversation gets going uh, and, and then you can talk about solutions. Uh, uh, but sometimes that's, that's blurry. Yeah. And then, of course, you get a report from the Child Care and Protection Board and it states, yeah, the suspect doesn't want to talk. And uh, yeah, we, don't, we, can, we cannot say much about him because he doesn't want to talk. Yeah, we have some information here and there. But, so it makes life difficult. So your point is absolutely valid. What you're suggesting is an alternative way of dealing with it, maybe. Um, and that is an interesting one. Thank you. Uh, I think we have to conclude here. And uh, so thank you so much again. And thank all of you for you. interesting uh, questions and discussion. And as we hear, it's, there are many questions and, and still some solutions to come up with. And so I really take your invitation of further collaboration seriously. And yeah, yeah. to see you and again. It's, it's taped as well, yeah. I think. So. And we also have a little um, gift for you to remember this one. Uh, wrapped into some Norwegian colors. Uh, it is a, a book about Tiny Bergen. And it's small stories from the most beautiful city in the world. So I think it could suit the subject. So maybe it is not small people who has written it, yeah. but maybe it is the way they would look at the city. Nice. Yeah. So thank you, thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.